Well, good to see you. How are you? Good, great. Good to see you, Ryan. I can tell this is fun because we were already just chuckling and having having some fun. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover, and you have a very interesting background. You were talking about your operate. You were an operator for a long time, buying companies, and then you've now been on the on the well, on the buy side, but also now you're advising in the intermediary space. And I'd love to just why don't you just give your quick background for everybody, and then we'll go back and unpack because how you even were wording your experience as an operator. I, that's I, I want to pull that thread and, and then start the journey there. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it goes way back. I was an electrical engineer, computer science back before it was cool to be in computer science. Uh, but my wife says I'm a fake, fake engineer because I took the technical sales route, rock automation. I was there over 15 years, uh, rookie sales guy to global vice president. Really loved startups. Wanted to get back to that. So was uh, COO of, uh, oh, actually was uh, CRO of a of a early stage company. We scaled up from a million to 50 million. Sold to private equity. Uh, branched over. Lived in Europe. Um, six years for a company COO of of uh, another tech company. Uh, we scaled that to 120 million, and that was sold to to private equity. And then co-founded a, a, a fintech company. And um, you know, we worked for six years. And when it came time to sell it, um, I looked back on my experience and had I had been involved in acquiring about a dozen companies, just out of strategic necessity. Not that I had any experience or training or knowledge or knew what I was doing and, uh, you know, figured out as we went and said, Hey, what, you know, we need to branch into this country, which we do. Why don't we buy someone? Great. Who should we buy? Let's find someone. How much we pay? I don't know. How much is it worth? How much would it cost to build it? Right. I mean, wh what, what's the time cost? And so we figured it out, you know, and, and over the course, we acquired about a dozen companies. And so when it came time to sell my company, the bankers had worked with were all like super smart, but they had a, they had a finance background. They're accounting people. And you know, it's like when you sell your house, you're not going to, you don't hire a banker to sell your house. You hire like a, like a salesperson to sell it. Or I look at people and say, take your very favorite CFO you've ever worked with. And you wouldn't put them in charge of sales. So it's just not the skills that they have. You wouldn't take your favorite salesperson, and put them in charge of finances because it, it would be a mess. <laughs> so there's just different skill sets. Anyway. So older, traditionally companies were, were asset intensive and, and it, they were more like financial instruments. You know, the, one of the company we sold for 120 million, we had 15 offices in a dozen different countries and we had, you know, foreign exchange and intercompany transfers. It was, a, it was a, com I mean, a banker needed to run that because it was a complex instrument. But a lot of these smaller companies are, are simple financially, but, but structuring the acquisition is more of a sales process. So anyway, it came time to sell it, decided we could do it on our own, had a sales background, thought we could leverage best in class enterprise selling techniques and technologies to sell it. Um, and we did, uh, one of our investors asked us to help them with another company and we did. And uh, so six years ago, Open Traction Advising, uh, I think there's an opportunity out there to help small companies get positioned with with larger companies. Um, Adam, my, my business partner in London about a year and a half ago, and uh, we did three deals last year. We're working on four right now. And, um, and it's a lot of fun. So yeah. So anyway, also no, that's awesome. We have a lot, lot to unpack, and I and I'm super excited about it. Cause, so, um, and a separate note, there's a, a gentleman named Ted who wrote a book called Branding for Buyout. His entire book was built on the fact that bankers and accountants should not be selling companies. I mean, so there's a there's a connection there. So uh, I I'll have to put you in touch, or I'll have to send you the episode and, and note to, to Ted that. that's probably listening to this. But and yeah. I want to get to that point of you know we'll kind of take the sequence of your timeline to get to kind of where you're at today and the things that you're seeing. Yeah. But to start when you were talking about as an operator, like, hey, we're going to buy this. We need it out of necessity. But <clears throat> there's so much like there's a knowledge gap in this whole like in the lower market. I did a, a, a podcast recently about the inefficiencies in the lower market because it's not public information. And there's an asymmetry yeah. of knowledge. And I just got done interviewing this guy. You're going to you're going to probably crack up on this. Well, he had the buyer pay him for due diligence. He ended up making 700 grand because the buyer was paying him in due diligence and not hitting their milestones. Wow. So like there's there's so much room for flexibility and maneuvering inside the lower market M&A yeah. space. However, there's like this, so the discussion that him and I got on that, why I wanted to tee this up to you is, what is the role of technical knowledge of like, how is this supposed to be done from deal structures to valuations to pricing to legal and all that? You know, you need to know that. And when I sold, I didn't know much of that at all. And you kind of alluded that you had, were in that similar situation versus overdoing the technical knowledge. And then the same thing on the sales side of like, hey, there's a strategic fit here, but I don't know any of this. So it's kind of like this balance. Yeah. Like, does that tee up and kind of go back to your operator background of like how you were buying these companies and the level of knowledge that was or wasn't involved? 
You know, a, a lot of it really comes down to, I mean, just, just the fact I've got operating experience on, on the background. Often, like I'll, when I talked to, and I've had like five calls this morning with, with prospective buyers, and, and often the buyers have less experience than, than I do buying companies. Like I see, I may have bought one company, two companies in 10 years. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And they don't really know. So sometimes it's, it's a matter of, you know, when they're trying to determine what the value is, ultimately the company's worth what someone will pay for it. And it can be wildly different. And they can pay for it in different ways. So the, the technical note, so the structure, most people focus mm -hmm. on, I want 10 million bucks, right? I want 20 million, I want 50 million. It's like, well, structure matters. It's like, well, <laughs> not to me. Like, I, I just want, it's like, well, what if it's a million bucks in cash and the rest is tied to an earnout over 10 years on something you can't control? Well, that's not a very good deal as opposed to what 10 million cash at close so, and sometimes they're levers, like if the buyer can't, they're struggling to get there. They say, well, let's talk about why you want to buy the company. It's like, well, we've got 50,000 clients. They've got 100. We can roll that product out to our 50,000. I said, all right, so if you're successful, get 10% adoption, 5,000 people buy it. All of a sudden, it's 50 times the size when you bought it. If that happens, you would have been happy to pay this price. Absolutely. Yeah, we'd be happy to then, mm -hmm. but there's risks. So I said, well, let's look at how much will you pay for what they've built to date? And then maybe there's some shared risk going forward to get them to what you know they, mm -hmm. they think it's worth it. You know, other times they may come up short. The, the the CEO might have a minority stake in the company, so paying a lot more for the company, only a short amount gets gets to the CEO. So maybe there there are ways through retention bonuses or uh, or, or mm -hmm. other. Ones. There are a lot of creative ways to get there, and a lot of it really comes down to listening to both sides, understanding what they can and can't do, and see if there's a common ground where people can move to make it happen. And it's not there's, well. Go like ahead. I want to, I want to interject there because the there's a there's a concept that we have in our training because like in principle two for our five intentional growth principles, it's all about valuations, deal structures, so that, you know enterprise equity, the net proceeds, and then how do you get your money? And, and there's this concept that uh, that we zeroed in on, uh, and I want to hear your thoughts on like how you view yeah. the different types of buyers because I saw one of your videos about strategic versus financial. Is yeah. we said okay because like valuation to get to enterprise, like you said, there's it's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. However, I think when people, when the people use that phrase, they use it as an excuse of not paying attention to their valuation today and how to grow value. It's just yeah. revenue, 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 which was the copier industry. It's like, well, what's this worth? Who knows? And we were, we're not gonna know till the goal line. Like that seems ridiculous. And I'm not saying yeah. you were saying that. So what we did is we said, there's two types of methods is the financial valuation, which is essentially intrinsic value based on the risk of your cash flow that it's gonna be there sustainable, predictable, and transferable cash flow today and in the you know in the future. And there's a, essentially a technical discounted cash flow. They say, okay, that's the risk based on the operations of the business and you know the size, all that stuff that we can know today and continue to focus on growing that value because that's kind of what private equity does and a lot of other people. And then there's the strategic transaction value where it starts essentially at that financial valuation, but it could go way up because of the strategic reasons that someone wants to buy it, or go down if a family wanted to gift it. But it started somewhere in log logical land of yeah. like, hey, th this is worth something. And so given the types of buyers and, and, and people that you come across, does that how does that constant land in your your world? No, you're, you're, you're exactly right, right? Because you've got, you've got bands, you can look at comps, but you know, we, we work primarily with, with software companies, but it just really depends. So you've got the, your different financial metrics, you've got EBITDA, you've got your growth, you've got your top line revenue, but then you've got like, like the strategic fit. And it's true that financial buyers are, are gonna look at the financials, right? Their job is, is to take someone's money, invest it somewhere, deploy it, and then five years later, return a lot mm -hmm. more, right? And they're focused all about internal rates of return. So their, their fundamental motivation is, is to buy low and sell high, right? So they're, they're intrinsically aligned with paying you less, not that because they're bad people, but that's, that's just what the reward, mm -hmm. but they don't want to pay, they want to win, but they don't want to pay any more than they have to. So, and, and they often, if it's, if it's a platform, if they're going to buy the company, grow it organically, maybe pull things onto it, they don't have anywhere else to go. Like that's, that's all they've got is what they buy. So mm -hmm. they can't stretch it that much. Whereas a strategic may have, you know, like we talked about, like if they've got 50,000 clients, you've got a hundred, if they can roll it out to all of them, it can scale. They just have a, a little bit different uh, approach to it. And then often what we're finding right now today is a lot of the strategics have private equity backing. Yeah, it's a nice little combination approach now. 
you get a bit of moat. Right? I mean, there's almost, what, $5 trillion in private equity mm-hmm. right now, which would make it, what, the fourth, third or fourth largest GDP in the world right now. It's it's enormous. Uh, I mean, it's it's about a fifth of the size of the public stock market. People don't realize that. They think it's like this tiny little industry. It's massive. It's effectively taken over the entire lower end of, of the public stock markets when Anyway, sorry, well, well, no, no, I, lo- I love these are don't don't get me wrong at all. Like I can rally around this kind of macro data all the time. Because it, I've, I found this stat. There's like thirty nine hundred and thirty nine fifty public companies. There's over eight thousand private equity backed companies. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so you start to look at like this is everywhere. And going back to the point of the intrinsic financial valuation versus the strategic transaction, which could yeah. be a premium. It's a lot of why is why is someone buying you and understanding the differences of the buyers? Right. Bring that back to your operation or operating experience of like maybe give a, like a couple of stories of like why you would want to buy someone and how that was driving your motives in the deals. Yeah. All right. So good question. So I was um, when I was uh, CEO of a company based in in France, strong European company, didn't have a strong presence in the U.S. They had a little bit, they had a footprint, right? That sent some some mercenaries out there to kind of like kind of grassroots. But the reality was, U.S. was by far the largest market. So the quickest way. To scale up quickly and become the the largest player was to acquire someone. So we researched different companies, and we found one that was that was domestic, right? They were U.S. only, and uh, we approached them and we bought them, and it 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 almost doubled our business and in in the single largest market. And then we could cross sell back and forth, so we could justify paying more. I mean, understanding how much it was worth was our first exercise. Like, what, mm-hmm. well, how much would it cost for us to build it? Like, how long would it? How much would we have to invest? And often you'll you'll look at that and you'll say, well, we could build it for less. And this is a thing that often comes up when someone's looking at buying your company. They go, well, we could build that. I say, well, sure you could, but how long would it take, right? Well, it might take two years, well, maybe three or four years. Well, what's the time value of all that money? And mm-hmm. what if you spend two, three, four years, build it, and you don't do a very good job, right? What if the product, you just don't have the skill set to build what we built well? And so you factor all of those those risks in there, or if you buy it now and you kind of run parallel things, so, you know, you look at taking out costs and the synergies and you come up with something that that you feel somewhat grounded in that, that you feel it's worth. Well, and so. what, I, what I find so fascinating hearing it from you you as a operator or strategic buyer is and let me know if I'm uh, if I'm right with how I, I'm regurgitating this is that you said we got to figure out what it's worth. You were saying, what, what is it worth to us in order to make the investment? It wasn't starting at the discounted cash flow intrinsic valuation of what their EBITDA was. It's more of like, Am I am I correct with that? It's like why would yeah. we want to do this, and how would we, how would this be? How much is this worth to us? Versus, hey, it might be a way lower valuation on the financial valuation for that seller who's planning on having potential, you know, different options that they're presented yeah. in front of. No, it's a good point. I mean, the reality is, as a strategic buyer, and again, I wasn't corp debt. I ran a business. I had a PL. So we really looked at it as as you know, like there, there's a movie sliding doors, like two different futures. One is organic, go it alone. And the other is, is we buy this company, we blend them, we take out some costs, we make some investments. And what does the, you know, the two, three, four, five year plan look like both for revenue and, and for EBITDA. And once you, once you have a model that you're, you're comfortable with, then, then you can have a feel for, uh, and often on the buyer side, you want to get them hooked on that future model because initially there's resistance. But once they build that model, and I guarantee every strategic buyer will build that model, they typically won't share it with you, but they will. And often they'll get pretty excited. You know, your business may be doing $5 million in revenue, and, and in their projections, cross-sell, their team globally, whatever it might be, they'll look at, you know, in five years, it's doing $25 million, and it's, you know, it's kicking off $10 million bucks in, in EBITDA off the bottom line. All of a sudden, the CEO is like, this is now a part of his future and he doesn't want to lose it. And the fear of losing a deal far outweighs the fear of, or the desire to add something. It's that whole like seven to one fear. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So once you paint that, then you've got a picture of, of what it's worth long term. And then, then it's easier to justify one example. We didn't buy the company, but one of the companies that we looked at buying uh, initially, the offers were in the 40 million. And by the time it was done, I give credit to the guy that the CEO and that was, that was driving the price up, but they sold it for 110 million bucks. They created 70 million bucks <laughs> in additional enterprise value by shopping it around. And it was much driven by, I think, the fear of losing it to a hated competitor as it was the desire to have it. It's like, this is a nice to have. This would really help us. But boy, if they have it, it puts us even farther behind and we don't want to let that happen. Well, and what I find that's awesome story and example is what I find so fascinating too is that it's going back to my, my one of my first comments of this 
this blend of understanding the like very granular details and intricacies of the M and A marketplace, evaluations, deal structures. But then also, once you have that knowledge, playing the emotional game, right? Yeah. I mean, because yeah. it, like what, everything you just described was an emotional situation. I mean, it, yet that yet these are the rules. So like you can't really have one without the other. But it's I think when and how to place the emphasis, knowing who the players are that's in front of you, and that going it, it, this with the lack of education in the space. It's hard to do one, both of those effectively to play the game effectively. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I always tell people it's it's really not that much different. Any company that's had any kind of success is is good at selling. It's to some degree they've had success. I mean, it's all over the board, but they've been good at selling. Well, selling your company isn't that much different, right? I mean, that's why I look at. I don't mean to pick on bankers. I know I sometimes do, but, <laughs> but okay. often what they'll do, they'll they'll, they'll create they'll create a, They use two colors. It's not quite black and white, but it's like two tone deck. It's jammed with a tons of in, ton of information. It's a hundred pages long, and it's it's this very dense deck. And they'll send it out to people, and it's like, hey, read this really difficult to digest deck of information. And if it looks interesting, call me back, and we'll loop you in the process. I mean, imagine as a company, if you told your sales team, create this hundred page deck, spam it to everyone, and if you re you're not going to sell anything. So it's the same thing. It's the classic. And I'm going off on a tangent, but like the Eagles no, versus Journeyman, the 20%, the Eagles are natural salespeople. They'll sit down, they'll say, Ryan, what keeps you up at night? What are you struggling with your business? What do you say? Oh, thanks a lot. Now that I know what you're talking about, I could talk about solving your problem. Whereas 80% of salespeople will show up and they'll say, Ryan, great to see you. All right, here's what I got. Here's a coffee cup, blah, blah, blah. And, and, they, and, they, <laughs> and you may or may not even care because I don't know what you care about, but those, it's the same thing here. It's like, it's asking the first question. I, I encourage people when they're selling their company and you're talking to buyers, at some point the CEO will be exposed. Ask them, why are you interested in buying my business? Understand why the buyer, otherwise you're just gonna start talking about stuff and it may or may not resonate. But once you know why they're interested, you can say, I agree, that makes a lot of sense. And not only could we do that, we could do this. Then they'll get more, the more excited they are, the emotional side of it, the more connected they are, the safer they feel, because at some point it's risk. They don't wanna screw up. They're gonna put their butt on the line to, mm -hmm. uh, to buy the company. They're gonna tell the board, they're gonna commit to it. They don't want to be wrong. So eliminating risk, getting them excited about the upside, and they'll stretch. And you build capital, and then the whole negotiation, you're going to ask for things, you take away capital. But being excited and painting a credible picture of a great future together builds up a lot of capital. So I, I want to, before I continue that thread and going into like the deal structures where you're talking about, cash, should we, does the cash include or not include kind of some of those thoughts? It, before we get into that, I want to put it, let's put a pin in there. I, mean, I want to make sure we go back to that is the emotional side for the seller. So there's the emotional side for the buyer, which you gave some wonderful examples on, but then the seller, you know, in the five principles that we created, the first one is your personal drivers. And then the second one is your yeah. financial targets. And what we want for everybody, Lowell, is to be able to say, I want this for my company, for my people, for the legacy or whatever that means to them. And then be able to layer that on top of their financial targets. And then the third principle is your exit options to say, option A, I get this valuation, but this is what happens to my people. Here's what happens to the company. And you don't know that until you do what you said, which is you ask. And but like so few people have the ability to like spread those options out and know what it means to them personally as well as financially. And because what I want is someone to be able to say, I want option A to sell to Lowell because here's exactly what they're going to do with the company and why. And here's the price versus this one over here. And it might be a million dollar Delta, yeah. but I'm intentionally choosing that because of these reasons. And so few people I see have the ability to do that. How many times do you run into issues with, like on the buy side or, or when you're representing a seller where they don't know that and it just, it just gums up the entire deal? Well, it's, it's tough. I tell people, you know, the goal is to have multiple options because it drives competition, it drives the price up. But at the same time, I tell people, I said that it, it's a bit of a curse because when you have options, you're going to like some things, you know, let's say, hey, Ryan's a great guy. I love working with Ryan, but his offer is lower. And, you know, and Lowell's a jerk, but man, his price is higher. And, so, and, and then you're struggling. Or you may have two co-founders, right? Or you may have a board that and the, the co-founders might disagree. It's like, you know, the, the technical person may like, to go down this path and you like to go down another. But I, I, I completely agree. You're exactly on the right page. I think the, the first thing is personally, like, like, what do you want to accomplish here? And I get that there's money and wealth that comes along with it. But but aside from that, what are you trying to come? And, and it starts with, you know, do you, do you want to stay on with the new company? Or 
do you, I've talked to people that said, I, I want to be gone like on day one, or if not day one, day five, like I'm out. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Others are like, hey, I'm happy to do a transition. I want to be professional, respectful, like whatever makes it. I want to make sure my employees land in a good spot. And others are like, I love this business. Like I'm all in. I want to roll over some of my equity. I want a second bite at the apple. You know, I'm happy to migrate to a chief product officer role, whatever it might be. But it is, you start thinking about these, these legacy issues are, are a pretty big deal. Like how, what do you want to leave behind? You're going to get a lot of money, right? At some point. No matter what, you know, and you want to make sure how your, your employees are treated. And you don't really know because you're going to give up control. So you don't know what's going to happen on the other side. And the process itself is initially it's exciting. You create the materials. You got to have a lot of conversations. That's kind of cool. You know, you're, it's like early dating, right? They, they love everything about you. Right? Everybody's, like, hey. everybody's on the high, right? Every, everybody's like, hey, hey, do you like, like early dating, right? Like, do you like camping? I love camping, right? <laughs> Ten years later, it's like, I hate camping. I can't believe maybe go camping. It's like, wait. You know, but they're. They're on the good behavior, which is which is great. And then you know you get to an LOI, and it's just some you can have some tough discussions. And then you get into the deep diligence, and it's it's it can just be brutal going through it. It's just soul sucking work to get through it, to get to the purchase agreement and all that kind of stuff. And so, if you've got multiple options, it can be tough when you've got that all that weight, and you're still trying to run the business and not take your eye off the ball. Last thing you want is to be three months into a process and your sales start to decline because you you weren't involved. Well, so, and and yeah. on on that pole, and like well, is and on that point is like bridging that kind of into like the deal structure and stuff too. Is like, you know, in, I'm curious, like when you're talking to sellers that are you know, they're talking, to engaging you, or they're starting that process. Like, I'm because of your profession and what you've been doing for decades, and same thing with me is like you can, if if someone says, well, I I want to stay on, or I don't want to stay on, or I want this, or I don't want this, you immediately are probably, and I don't know, I'm speaking maybe too incorrectly to you, but is. <laughs> The, oh, well, well, that's probably going to have to adjust the, there's maybe going to be a, comport, a portion of an earnout or an employment contract. There's these things that are a ripple effect of what someone wants. But most of the time they're just saying still 50 million bucks cash and I leave. Oh, wait, if I, you know what I mean? They don't know the, like the, 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 the second, third order effects of what they want and how that impacts the deal structure or. That's true. The, and how do you, how do you generally describe that to people that aren't aware of like the, the, the ripple effect. Yeah, I mean, so part of it is it, it might limit the buyers. Like if you say, I want out immediately, I'm gonna walk. Some people might be nervous about that. So some buyers may may not be interested. And it's hard to quantify. So a lot of it's kind of a judgment thing. You try to kind of walk them through it. But it's, it's, it's really just it's telling stories about kind of what's happened in the past. One of the other big factors that, that rolls into it is, I call it certainty to close, right? I mean, statistically, bankers will tell you at LOI, 50% fall apart. Our goal is 100% not to pull apart, 100% that close. That's we don't lose 50%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we, we run around 90%. And part of that truly is it's putting a lot of thought, like de-risking it up front. So before it gets to an LOI, asking the buyer, hey, if this deal were to fall apart, from your perspective, what do you see as the biggest risk of going sideways? They say, well, hey, we're all in. The only thing I can see might fall apart is this, this, and this. It's like, okay, let's... Let's talk about those three things mm -hmm. like before we're committed to only you and make sure that those three things are swept under the rug. But certainty is a big deal because if you spend the money and the emotional currency to get to a purchase agreement and it falls apart, it's it's awful. People, the, the deal fatigue is is in there and it's it's you say, well, you could at the beginning, you can say, well, if that doesn't work, I'll just start off with another one. And everyone I've talked to, once they get through it, they go, now I get it. You, you just don't have the gas to start started up well again. it's like use your dating analogy that's like saying well we moved in together we'll just we'll just restart with a new, someone else well yeah but that was really hard <laughs> technically you're 100 percent right but it's a lot more of challenging than that <laughs> yeah yeah so you know what i what i a couple of the topics that i want to roll into is you know you had talked about what i saw on your landing page um prior to coming on the show is you mentioned identity in the business and there's not a lot of not a lot of people that outwardly say they, they'll acknowledge that that's important, but why did you address that as like one of the topics that you like to talk about as the owner's identity tied into their business and how that impacts what they want long-term with it? Well, I think, you know, if, if someone is, I find some people don't realize how much their business has become an extension of, of them as a human being. I mean, it's almost like a, a, a virtual part of the reality and they, and they, and they don't realize, and they don't realize what they're giving up and and both personally, you know, classic is when you meet someone, one of the first questions that comes up with Americans is, uh, so what do you do? Well, if you're a business owner, you got a business, it's pretty easy and you might minimize it. You don't wanna talk, you don't wanna brag, 
but you got something to talk about. So when it's when it's gone, it's like, what do you talk about? You don't, you, you know, you lose, you lose a bit of identity. So there's this whole non-financial part of uh, of retirement that I'm not an expert at. That is an interesting one to, to to go through. But but I know a lot of people that they talk about selling their business, but when it really comes down to it, I'm not sure they can. They can part with it. Ever. Do you have any <laughs> ever? <laughs> no, yeah. I I totally agree with that. Where did that realization come? You know, there have been a couple of of business people that I've talked to who've owned their businesses for you know 30, 40, 50 years, and actually, so a deal we did um, a couple of years ago, well, probably three, four years ago, he'd been in business for thirty plus years, clearly wanted to be retired and do different things, I think, but it was just having a hard time letting go of the business. And it's it's tough. It's very, very personal. You know, it's out of the transactional nature of, you know, buying and selling and that sort of thing. So it's a it's a highly personal thing. I'm I'm super respectful of that. And sometimes really try to understand, really try to get to know the person and what is it you're trying to accomplish. Um, we had one. I tried to keep these generic enough so people can't. But there, where, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, like, the it was this product or this you know, this or this marketplace? Yeah, no, we got to be a little bit more discreet, right? <laughs> yeah, there, there was. He was at a point where, for different reasons, to fund the business had taken on some debt through some things through his spouse and was emboldened to the business. Like the business had to be successful. She couldn't retire until this was paid back. And I knew that. I and he told me that. He said, I'm hiring you because you have to make this go through. But then when we got into it, some things got got distracting and and, and there were thoughts about, well, maybe I won't sell, blah, blah. And and I would have to kind of a coaching perspective, really just sit down and just say, Look, remember your the big goal is ha- marital happiness, never have to worry again, never work again. If you stay with this, all three of those things are are at risk. And and ultimately got there. He was happy. But it's 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 easy to lose perspective when you're in the middle of the deal, when the emotions and the stress are high. It's easy. I'd say it's even when people have said, I want out, I want to go. At some point, I'm, I'm not surprised when they'll say, I don't know why I'm selling this thing. I think I should stick around. So, but- well, and, and I think, I, I think when some, there's, there's a couple of things that I wanted to, I could go down rabbit holes there is that I don't think most people know. And they say, I want out. I don't know. I don't think they know what they want out of. Like what the first thing I've done now over the last eight years, like people, I want out. Like, out of what? Your financial asset or your job? You have to separate those two. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't even want to keep talking. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and they're like, oh, that's a, those are different. And most people don't unless yeah. they had some sort of investor that forced them to think about their company like an asset. And I'm right. curious on like when you were going through the, the acquisitions uh, as an operator or even your advising role, how many times someone says it that oh it doesn't matter and can you immediately tell or how many times you get to the bottom of the goal line you're like this is like everybody was just lying to our like everybody was just (laughs) lying that this was you know gonna happen because it was you know look at look at the personal identity you know the how how intertwined and infused it is that that people don't even know like i want out of what you know what i mean like because yeah. like I, I think they they say i want out they see a big it's so simple yeah. that it's like i want out there's a dollar amount please get me out of this lull but then it's yeah. like they don't know that they don't actually know what they want out of and by the time you go through due diligence you're like they're they're get their babies getting ridiculed like oh you don't have contracts your you know executive team is a b minus team like yeah. and then all of a sudden they get to the end and they're like well I didn't know all of that was gonna happen so it's kind of like I guess the question is how many times do you see where someone is just not being truthful to themselves and it completely messes up the deal and I don't know if you experienced that on the on the buy side where you're like trying to get this done and you just realize that because you wanted to change the logo at the end like the logo was what blew up the deal and you never would have thought that would happen. No, it's a good point. I mean, there's, there's, there are, there, there are both sides to it. And I ask people, like, you know, is the goal like, are you trying to de-risk your balance sheet? Because often people, they're, they're, most of their assets are in this business, right? So mm-hmm. in many ways, and so you don't have to. And many people don't realize that. Well, you could sell to like a financial buyer, and you can still run the business, right? They'll maybe they'll buy sixty percent of it. You'll lose control, but you keep forty percent. They'll bring in professional resources. You'll have a boss and you'll have a board. But you can still run the business if you still want to run it. But you can put substantial amount of money in your family's safe, and so that's that's a pretty good option. And then on the buying side, it it you just have to realize it is personal. This is their baby, and you know we a different example. But we bought a house. We moved to Milwaukee years ago out of an estate, and we when we're dealing with the uh, you know the son whose parents had been killed in a car accident, right? So you can't. We realized you couldn't go around and say, well. 
you know, this, this sucks. And right, you get just rid of the mantle. Your grandpa is, built the mantle. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So you got to be like respectful. And it's the same way with someone's business. You realize that if they're a hired gun as a CEO, you can say, look, look, you know, your churn's too high. This sucks. That's bad. This bad. And you can just have that conversation. And again, you want to be respectful. You can say, look, these are, these are things that are, we're concerned about uh, that we either won't pay for, or you need to make them right. Um, but if it's, if it's their baby, you need to be, a, you need to like read the body language. It's beyond just the transactional nature of how do you, how do you get to a deal, point those things out or some things you just, you recognize those, but you just choose not to address them because they can't change them. Well, and like you said at the very beginning, I mean, it's, it's an emotional deal. Like accountants aren't leading the sales process and you're also dealing with another human being that's selling something that's in deeply intimate to them it's yeah. just i mean yeah but they, obviously the, the the numbers and stuff like that matter but it's not the driving force of what you know people buying emotions and justify rationally whatever their decision was <laughs> yeah it's really true at all levels it's amazing there's an emotional component to all these deals that go through and as a ceo that signs off on it there's some level of whether it's ego or pride or believing that they'll be successful but they want to be successful because there are all these deep rooted reasons why the logic makes sense, but at some level, someone emotionally says, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. It's true with everything. I think anything anyone ever buys ever, there's an emotional component <laughs> attached to it. hundred percent. The um, kind of uh, taking a slight detour into your SaaS space, because you, you, you spend a lot of time in SaaS. First of all, curious on why you, after your, your corporate career and everything, why did you move towards SaaS? What's your interest in uh, um, desire to stay involved in that? I love SaaS companies, uh, B2B SaaS in particular. They're, again, they're particularly, you know, 10 years ago, maybe probably 15 years ago, with the advent of AWS and Azure and, you know, you know, Amazon's rolled out. It used to be to start up a technology company, you'd have to raise a couple million bucks just to build a data center and software and, and the tech people. And now you don't need to do that. I mean, any individual can spin up some servers and have a website up and running. So there, I saw the level of creativity in startup was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Right, and you see it everywhere right now with with the amount of startups. And I use the baseball analogy. There, there are there are a lot of home runs. They get a lot of the press. So a hundred million or more, like right, the unicorns. But there are a lot of singles, doubles, and triples. And the percentages are similar too to baseball. There are a lot of strikeouts, uh, a lot of singles, doubles, and triples that are good businesses. They're they're real businesses. They add real value to other businesses. But they don't have the hockey stick growth to be the hundred million dollar business. At some point five, six, seven, eight, 10 years in, the founders often or their investors want out or they want to change. And and I find those to be interesting and a lot of fun to be a part of. Uh, we get involved in companies you know, across the board that, that are, are found a unique solution to a problem that I find fascinating that someone is so passionate and so knowledgeable about this, this very nuanced, tiny area. And um, and they built a really good product around it. And, but at some point they want to be a part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. So, um, super helpful. And, and I, I'm, I want to hear your thoughts on the valuations of SaaS companies compared to like traditional, right? Cause we were talking about like a discounted cash flow based on the risk of the cash flow versus the strategic nature of someone that wants to strategically buy this. Maybe give us a 30,000 foot overview of like how SaaS companies are valued and why maybe given some of the context yeah. that we've laid so far. Yeah. I mean, SaaS companies are, are valued. The ones that we work with are valued on, on top line revenue. So it's multiples of, of revenue. Now the multiples of revenue might have a, a component that's tied to EBITDA, you know, or, or is it profitable, but they'll look at churn as the biggest metric. Ultimately the reason SaaS is so popular and so valuable, like wildly profitable. If you look at the, well, wildly profitable, wildly valuable, you could argue mm -hmm. profitable. If you look at the publicly traded SaaS companies, if the if the revenue is sticky, it's almost like buying an annuity stream. Like that revenue, even if I don't do anything, if I don't sell any new clients next year, that revenue will continue. And people have found that that is extremely valuable. If there's high churn, so if you've got, for example, 50% churn, that means in two years, all of your clients are gone. That's not, a perpetual license that, that on average, someone bought a two-year license. That's more like license software. Those companies aren't, aren't as valuable. You've seen, you know, COVID's driven the, the digitization of everything that you can think of. And I think a lot of companies have benefited from that. Uh, the valuations, like I say, in the public markets are, you know, you see the 20, 30, 40, hundred X valuations on revenue is kind of hard to fathom. But the other thing that's interesting about SaaS is unlike, 
you know, I've been a part of some tech enabled services companies and you say, well, we want to, we want to double in size next year. Well, in order to do that, we need to double the number of people that we have and, you know, hiring a hundred people or 500 people in multiple countries and scaling it up. It's hard work in theory, especially right now with the labor market. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, And people sick. It's, it's super tough, but a SaaS company, if it's, if the arc, if it's architected and built well, could be a $5 million company, could be bought by a much larger company. And I use that analogy, if they've got 50,000 clients and you've got 100, if they can get 5,000 to sign up, it's 50 times the size. And in theory, without a lot of work, you can spin it up without adding a whole lot of employees. And then the thing just prints money. You've got a, you've got a virtual cash machine. And that's where you see some of these valuations being driven really high, because as the buyer, you can legitimately overpay because you're still going to make way more than you paid for it. So, yeah. And I mean, there were some people, I mean, I've had plenty of uh, people on the show where they, and they've talked about like, I mean, because other you're doing it, I mean, you can, you can see these public companies, you're like, well, if they're getting valued at 20 times revenue or 30 times revenue, it's an easy metric to then say like, here's how much we need to spend, spend in order to get our customers and our churn where it needs to be in order to get the valuation. It's very obvious what the valuation would be to that buyer. And, uh, I yeah, I want to go, you you mentioned a phrase tech enabled service and and I want you to explain that I, I I'm I'm familiar with what you're talking about I want you to explain it for the listeners and then how that relates to potentially changing a business model and the way your company's valued yeah well you've got you know, like peer services businesses and um are pretty straightforward peer SaaS is kind of on the other side there are no services it's literally just a subscription so in between you've got a a business that's that's people based but You've got technology behind it that's driving a lot of automation. I think it, it automates a lot of work processes. So it's uh, it's a bit of a hybrid. It's not pure services, but you've got a human component. Yeah, it might be project management, et cetera. So it's kind of I, in between. Well, and I find it what in to give some context on the kind of the second part of that question is that like I, I think about you name a consulting practice or like, you know, people that are implementing SAP or just all these different service-based businesses, because we are such a heavily dominated service-based economy that it's one times revenue and it's, you know, high component of earnout. If it's just a bunch of people, all of a sudden, like, and the reality is like you have, a, you're solving a problem for a you know large percentage of your, of your customers and taking that problem and putting some technology to it. Have you seen, or do you have any good examples or, or maybe you could debunk what I'm thinking is, you know, you take, you can, you can fund a product development and then create a company that then is valued on a multiple revenue versus, <laughs> you know, a high multiple revenue versus, you know, a high degree of earnout or whatever it might be of your current service service company. You, yeah. if you follow the question that, that I'm asking? No, no, I, I do. In fact, what's uh, a company, I'll leave them anonymous, but a company that, that, that traded a, a couple of years ago, it was a, um, a, a creative agency. So it was a services company that did a lot of design work. And then someone came up with the idea of, um, hey, we could build a software platform that helped to organize. You have all these creative people, but there's always an operational person that organizes the creative people. It's typically done on spreadsheets and work planning and that kind of stuff. So they built some software to manage all that. Well, that software turned out to be like critical for all these other agencies. So they 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 separated and had success with the software platform. And then that software platform was worth far more than the company that it had, had been born in. And that's not uncommon. You, you see that a fair amount where, where people say, hey, we should build a platform. I mean, anyone, anything any of us do, you could build a platform that automates all these tasks that we do. And the reality is there's probably a market for it with all of the other people that do what we do. What What is the appetite like, when you're looking at different buyers out there well, right now? Like, what do people really gravitating towards? I mean, your overall market, you know, overview, right? Like, what what are people, where's the, where's the attention getting focused right now? You know, if you take the private equity piece of it, right, they, they, they have a strategy or a thesis that's driven by current events. Where do they think, where they want to invest? And, and you know, it might be, you know, rolling up eye clinics or, you know, it might be, hey, COVID's really driven everyone to e-commerce. So, uh, let's look at technology that enables small companies to do e-commerce more efficiently and compete with the, the the Amazons and the Walmarts online, like reducing the cost of shipping, like driving efficiency. So particularly in, in SaaS, there's been, I think, more and more people understand the value of SaaS. More and more people every month step into it and want to get a piece of it. 
So, but it's across really almost all industries. Um, anything that's been, particularly right now, anything that's been driven by anything that's being digitized, it, uh, you know, it, it's it's true in it's true in education, uh, it's true in the utilities, everywhere. I know one of the pretty hot spaces. It's pretty simple, but you've probably noticed if uh, if you have an appointment with a with a doctor, or if you've got a, a home repair man coming to fix your washer dryer, much of that is automated now. You used to have to call in. Now you can sign up online. <clears throat> you get text messages of when they're arriving. That all drives huge efficiencies um, for you as a consumer, but also on their side that they don't show up when no one's home. How many of these sad, because I, you know, there's a lot of founders with the ideas like you were saying, and they're, they're either raising money or they've got an idea that they bootstrapped it. And do you see the the birth of some of these SaaS companies, or not the birth of some of these SaaS do you see a desire from traditional businesses buying SaaS companies to enable their technology? I don't know if that was part of your your play back when you're operating, or if you've seen other buyers show up to the table and say, hey, we've got a traditional distribution company or manufacturer or service of a company, and we want to accelerate our growth by acquiring a SaaS company, which is yeah. different. It depends whether they want that to drive efficiencies in their core business, or if they want to try to become a SaaS company. I, I met with a CEO of a company yesterday who come into a company that was, I call it tech enabled services, similar trading values. And over the past six years, I think seven years, he's migrated that to almost a pure SaaS model um, and increased the revenue. You know, a company that we sold a few years ago had a traditional license based model and the guys that bought it saw that the value converting it to SaaS, even at the same dollar volume, it would be worth, you know, two, three, four, five times that <laughs> amount. So, so we do see that. And we see companies, one of the tricks that you get into is if you've got a, a large company, $100 million company that itself is valued on EBITDA, they can often struggle to pay SaaS multiples on a, call it a $2 million company. I mean, if they've got a wholesale transformation, like they're at 100 million, but they're going to go out and buy 100 million in revenue and grow that to mm -hmm. 200, that's all SaaS. At that point, you'll be valued as a SaaS company. But if the minority of their total revenue is SaaS, they often struggle to be competitive with the SaaS multiples. I, well, you just hit on such an important topic. Well, because it, like, if I had, if I could eliminate one thing, it would be anybody calling me up and be like, Ryan, I got an out of the blue offer. And it's like, and what do I, it's like, because they're so unready for it. I don't want to sell for 10 years, but I mean, like, I swear to God, out of the hundreds of people that have been through our training in the last 18 months, 60% of them have had an out of the blue offer since they went through the training. So I wasn't planning on selling, but now I've got, <laughs> now I've got this offer. But the reason I bring up that, that story is, if you like, if you have a SaaS company that gets an out of the blue offer for that hundred million dollar EBITDA valued company, like you just mentioned, the offer could be significantly lower. I mean, what was the example you gave? It was fifty million, and they sold it for one hundred and ten. Like the people, like maybe just speak to out of the blue offers and why that one thing that they saw might have zero indication of what reality is. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. They understand how the buyers operate. Just like we run a, a sell side process. So we'll reach out to, you know, 50, 100, 200 potential buyers for your company. If you've got an inbound offer, it's because they did a buy side process. And so they they did a market analysis. They've got a corp dev person or they hired a banker, analyze the market, identify companies, value them, and they made a bunch of offers. It's like the house we live in now, when this is a long time ago, but we said we lined up, it was a different market then but we said all right we're gonna we're gonna line up the offers it's take it or leave it and then the second one the third one well and we did that because we wanted to avoid competition they run a buy side process and the reason they run a buy side process one they they probably have a genuine interest in that area but they want to avoid uh people like me calling them that are running a process the other direction because they know they'll have to pay more and because there's more capital than there are companies to buy right now there's a lot of competition uh, private equity in particular has really doubled down. A lot of strategics have as well. They've invested in corporate development where they hadn't before. And they are hoping to get a hold of you, shine, you know, this shiny thing in front of you the and carrot. buy it. Because they know, they know if you find five other potential buyers, they're going to have to pay more. It may or may not be a lot more but they know they'll get a better deal dealing with you directly. And especially if you don't hire someone to represent you, typically these are professional buyers and, and they'll just know tips and tricks. Like we talked earlier, I think it was before the show, they'll say, 
they'll say, we want the cash in your business. And you don't know. You think, oh, we value the business at this, but we want all the cash. You're like, oh, okay, I guess that's what they want. Well, bankers tell you, no, it's cash-free, debt-free. Like, well, what's that mean? It's like, well, you know, these, you know or, or it's negotiating the, the net working capital at close. Like, that's a big deal. Like, that that can be, you know. I want to I want to pull that thread. I'm interrupting you because I want to pull that thread. Well, because we had, we had a client and uh, they were like, it was in the like 50 to 70 million dollar range ish. And they're like, Oh, we got on the move off. So this whole scenario like unfolded and like, Oh, well, we're just going to have our brother's M and a attorney do the deal, not an investment banker. And I was like, do you think that an attorney knows and can calculate networking capital? <laughs> and so it just, and I might even be, t- I'm probably talking over my listeners head. So I want to hear you describe why, someone shouldn't just have their attorney just do the deal unless you know and, and that doesn't always apply for the, like the lower lower market where it's brokerish where like you know if someone's got an offer and the, there's someone's going to skim 10 15 percent off the top there's a chance that you could have an accountant and an attorney do it more effectively but in the space that you're talking about the cash free debt just the deal structures explain that yeah. and how the the attorney approach is most yeah. likely not the right approach well, one of my favorite attorneys once told me, he said, uh, there's a joke that attorneys tell that if, if it was left solely to the attorneys on both sides, to, no deal would ever get done. And it's because they're risk averse. Their job is to scare the crap out of you and eliminate risk that anything go wrong. Well, a truly risk-free deal is never going to happen because neither side will will agree to it. Because risk free technically is a U.S. Treasury at 0.01 percent yeah. rate of return. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you want to be smart and you want to know what 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 the main things are. But the other thing, well, and again, I, I have a ton of respect for attorneys in this. But attorneys are they're they're paid by the hour. So you know, and often they're very very expensive, right? I mean, cheap attorneys are three four hundred bucks an hour. The expensive ones are five six seven eight hundred dollars an hour. Often there's a team. So that bill, that flywheel can run up pretty high at some point as well. But often the lawyers will talk about this is a legal thing and they'll say, well, that's a business issue. You need it. They don't want to, like a business issue would be, well, do you, do you think uh, like networking capital, like what do you think is a reasonable networking capital? It's not as simple as just, or what do you think is reasonable for a target networking capital, right? And that's just your cash. It's primarily, it's your cash. If you've got assets and machinery, thing, but basically it's usually your, it's your cash, it's your accounts receivable, it's your accounts payable, right? That those are the big things that get. And the, people say, "Well, I just I want the cash." It's like, well, they 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 want. I won't spend too much time on this, but they'll, well, no, it's okay because we get into all this detail in our training. And the the funny thing that we joke around, and you can you can take this example and run with it, is that yeah, if depending on how that's calculated, the seller could go collect all the receivables, yeah, and then yeah. The, the then the buyer has no working capital. Exactly. <laughs> you could, and not that someone would do this, but they could. You could, you could agree to a number, and then it's like, or, or a cash number. So let's just agree to cash. It's like, well, but then I could, I could offer a ten percent discount to prepay on everything, uh-huh. and I could stop mm-hmm. paying all my bills, and then you end up with this company that that you have to write a, a bunch of checks for. So it, it protects against that, but also just negotiating what a fair networking capital number is in every deal is a subject of negotiation where. The buyer will look back 12 months and they'll look at your worst cash flow month and they'll say, you need this much to protect against that. And you may say, hey, this is a profitable business. We add cash to the balance sheet every single month. I, I shouldn't have to leave any working capital in it because you'll be fine. And it's always an argument where they'll, they'll find the worst possible day that you had. You say, well, we weren't good at collecting cash. You'll be better. That, that won't happen. And it, it often means hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sometimes it's, I've seen it. Uh, I think the biggest we saw was a swing of 1.3 million that we negotiated in, in target networking capital. That's a lot of money. I, I can promise you absent the help of an advisor that, that you're just not going to get there. So there, there's a lot of little things like that. It's negotiating your non-compete. Do you really want to be negotiating your non-compete with your future boss? They say, I am here for life, but man, this non-compete's really tight. It just puts you in an awkward position where we can be the bad guy or, or retention bonuses, or even your salary or your bonus structure or the earnout targets, whatever it might be. And I, I got to give good investment bankers and intermediaries like yourself so much credit because for business owners that don't understand this stuff, how freaking frustrating it must be to you to go, okay, so I'm going to give you 3% of my 20 million bucks. That doesn't, well, I just have my attorney do it. But like you just described, like if someone doesn't know what networking capital is, yeah. you have to explain it to them and then talk about how your fee is going to help say that. Cause so like I see, like you just said, like, I mean, you, 
the fact that you're going to have an auction and different comp competitors that drive up the price and then the networking capital and your employment agreements, all of these things should be well worth the fee. So I, like, what do you usually say to people when they say, I don't know, I might, I don't know if the fee is worth it. Like, I mean, I just going to do it myself. How do you, how do you break it down to make it a, a, an easy discussion? You know, it's often we'll have them talk to other clients that we've had who felt the same way up front. And they'll, and they'll, they'll walk away and they'll say, oh my God, I, I mean, I just, I, I can't imagine trying to navigate this without you. And I'll, I'll usually frame it up to people like, like this is the fee structure. And, and on the one hand, I acknowledge it, 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 it sounds like a lot, but here's what you get for it. You know, and if we can't make a difference, if we can't get you 5%, if you don't think I can get you 5% more for your company through all these things, then we shouldn't work together. But, but, because that's low hanging fruit, but can also just protect a lot of different things. Because a lot of things will come up where you don't even know what it is, like the networking. Tech. And I've talked to people, I mean, like, like really, really bright, went to top schools, MBA schools. You get this networking capital. And it's kind of like three dimensions move. And if you don't live, if you live with it every day as an accountant, it's it's pretty straightforward. But if not, you're just like, this doesn't make sense. Like I've got cash. And if you may have prepaids or unearned revenue and it makes mm -hmm. people's heads spin. And I've had multiple <laughs> CEOs say, I don't understand it. I've tried to understand. It. I don't, I don't care. This is what I want. <laughs> I need this much cash out of my business, period. Or I'm not selling the company. And I'll go back to them and say, look, I understand what you're saying. This is what it's got to be, or it's not going to work. So yeah, um, that's awesome. Advocate, advocate on your side. Yeah. Uh, so part of it is financial. Uh, part of it, part of it, honestly, is uh, uh, I don't know if I should say this on podcast, but I've joked with my wife before. Oh, like, oh, there's, <laughs> there's no, don't hold it back, don't hold anything back. <laughs> I said, it's it some days I feel like a hostage negotiator, right? Because you've got a, a buyer that is just upset; they've gone off the rails. A good example would be you're selling to a competitor and the competitor says, well, we want to, we want to see your, do a code review. You know, and the seller is like, they're not looking at my code. They're a competitor. This is bullshit. No way. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and then, then the buyer's mad. They're like, I can't believe let's buy the code. We're paying for the IP. This is ridiculous. I don't know. Who do they think they're? And I said, and so you, it's reframing. It's telling the buyer, well, all right. So imagine Microsoft was going to buy you guys. They're your most hated competitor. Like, and they want to look at your code. Would you let them? Oh, hell no. It's like, okay, well, that's how they feel. All right. All right. I get it. Okay, same okay. Thing. It talked to the seller and I say, well, you know, what if you were buying X, Y, Z? Would you buy them without looking at the code? No. It's like, oh, okay. I get it. So then you say, all right, you both understand now the temperature is down. Now, now let's figure out a way that you can get what you need without jeopardizing what they've got, which is kind of a delicate dance. And there, the reality is, and you've been through a deal, so you understand, there, there are hundreds of things that will come up that, that I call them deal killers. And, then, and, and often it takes a little bit of creative, like, all right, Let's let's everyone stay in their corner, cool down a little bit, and let's see if there's another way to get to something that's that's agreeable. I've, I've heard this, the, phrase, the phrase from an investment banker is every deal dies a thousand deaths before you <laughs> goes over the and those uh, and the, every one of those deaths is an emotional emotional toll. You, you, oh, yeah. you get the emotional oh. capital that's disappearing. <laughs> Towards the end, often people are just just gassed, but then they close. You sign, you close. And this is my favorite. And they sit and they hit refresh on their bank account till the numbers <laughs> change. And then it's like, oh my God, we did it. You know, and then we go drink champagne. At least we did before COVID. And uh, <laughs> and then, it, then a lot of it's forgotten. It's amazing how a lot of it dis dissipates. Well, this has been so much fun. I know we're uh, we're out of time here, but there's two questions I want to ask you. Uh, intentional is the name of the podcast, and I love hearing people's definition of it. So, what's your definition of the word intentional? I think intentional is uh, is have a plan. I mean, just, I mean, don't just wander around. I think wandering around is half of it, showing up and wandering around. But intentional is uh, think, have a plan, think about what success looks like, and then figure out how you get there. But a lot of people don't really, and I say when you're interviewing for a job, I think one of the best questions is, uh, so paint a picture of success for me. If I'm successful in my role, what's that look like? Most people will say, that's a really good question. Uh, and they have to think about it. But, but think about it. Take the time to think about it. That's awesome. Lowell, where does everybody find you? So you can email me at uh, Lowell at tractionadvising.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Lowell Rickliffs. There's only one. It's hard to spell. And uh, at tractionadvising.com, um, our website online. Happy to chat with people, um, answer questions. This has been an absolute blast. So, so, thanks yeah. so much for spending the time. My pleasure. Yeah, this is fun. Thanks, Ryan.